the beginning that you have made me. Martin Indyk was born in London, England. He was raised and educated in Australia, where he turned to international relations, made his career in the United States, and wound up being the first and second Jewish-American ambassador to Israel, in which he played a major role in the peace process of the 1990s. All of which seems to beg the question, does it ever get confusing? I have uh, a case of triple loyalty. <laughs> It's not a question of loyalty, but a case of identities, isn't it? No, it's been a search for identity uh, from the beginning. <laughs> can can <laughs> and, you try uh, and share the conclusions with us? <laughs> <laughs> no, the journey continues. But part of it was, uh, was to come to uh, Israel when I was a uh, postgraduate student. Mm -hmm. And I enrolled here in the Hebrew University to do a master's degree in international relations. It was the summer of 1973. And I uh, started uh, studying Hebrew at the Ulpan Hakaits. And just before classes were supposed to start, uh, the war broke out. And I was in Jerusalem for the Yom Kippur War. And then as a Mitnadeva volunteer, I went into a kibbutz in the south. And uh, that was a kind of defining moment for me in terms of my search for identity. I, uh, I sat up at night listening uh, on my radio to the BBC reports of Henry Kissinger. <laughs> flying in to get the ceasefire and from that moment on I became absolutely uh, obsessed about the idea that I too should play some role in trying to make Israel safe because that would make me safe and, do, do really and through, through diplomacy my interest was in international relations and so I went back to Australia and did my PhD on the role of the United States in resolving the Arab-Israeli conflict. Kissinger and Sadat were my uh, heroes and uh, I never knew exactly how it would work out but I knew my job in life was to try to help Israel make peace. So my journey led by purely serendipitous circumstances to Washington where I set up a think tank and to Bill Clinton where I became his advisor during his election campaign to the White House right at the moment when all of Israel's Arab neighbors under the Madrid conference were negotiating with Israel. Rabin had been elected and there was a chance to make peace and I was at the side of the President of the United States advising him what did on the feel peace like? process. It felt like Bashir, you know, somehow God was watching me. He wanted me to do this. Uh, how else could you explain it? That 10 years after you know, an Australian professor comes to Washington, there he is at the precise moment that the peace process is opening up. And then, two years later, after the Oslo Accords and the Israel-Jordan Peace Treaty, Clinton uh, sends me to Israel as the first American Jewish ambassador to Israel. And five months later, Rabin is assassinated. And so from the heights thinking we're, we're almost at the summit. I told Clinton before I left, you know, we've got two more agreements to go, one with Syria and one with Lebanon. And, you know, he said, I want you to work on the Syrian one. And then suddenly, Rabin is gone and the whole peace process craters. And I go back to Washington, I'm Assistant Secretary for the Middle East and the State Department, and it's, it's really tough. Everybody's giving us a hard time. Saddam Hussein, Bibi Netanyahu, it's really terrible. And then suddenly, Netanyahu's government collapses. Barack gets elected. And Barack comes to Washington and asks Clinton to send me back to work with him to get the, the peace deal with the Syrians and with the Palestinians, the final deals. And I come back to Israel. I have a second chance. And I would come up to Jerusalem and in my spare time between meetings, I would scout around the real estate to see where we will put the embassy and where Ooh. we will put the residence and uh, I really believed that, that it was going to happen this time will and, it, it, ever and it all created again. Will it ever happen? Yeah. Well, I don't know. We have to watch the end of the movie. <laughs> it's not, it hasn't ended yet. I but I've never given up on my belief that it will happen. I want to catch you by your words. You said that um, you wanted to make Israel safe for you to feel safe. You're now an accomplished person, you, you've played a part on the world stage, you're well recognized the world over. Do you really feel that you won't be safe if Israel will not be safe? Is that a, really a sense that you carry with you? Well, I think it's a sense that every Jew carries 
with him or her in one way or another. There is that basic insecurity, it's a, the, the dark part of our hearts that is a product of our history you know, over thousands of years. How can it not be in our DNA by now? That sense that suddenly uh, it can all, it can all uh, be gone again. And every generation there's a new devil that arises that wants to destroy the Jewish people in one way or another. Now we have you know, Ahmadinejad in Iran. So I think it's true. So I'd like to turn now from looking inside to looking out and we spend a lifetime doing political and diplomatic work and international relations. And you're obviously very much in touch with your Jewish roots. What does the world look like from Jewish perspective? It actually looks like an amazing place for, for uh, the Jewish people in my time. This is in many ways, feels like a golden age for the Jewish people. In what uh, sense? In the sense that, that, you know, for all of the talk about rising anti-Semitism and so on, we are a free people, we have our own, own land, we are free to exploit our talents in, in countries like the United States where Jews have had amazing experience this last century and risen to some of the highest offices in the land of immense influence beyond their numbers on, in every area of creative activity. So it feels very good to be a Jew in these, in these years. So what are the challenges at a time like this? There's such a golden The biggest age. challenge is for Israel to achieve peace with its neighbors, particularly with the Palestinians. That? Well, we have to try harder, you know. And we have to try to put our, ourselves in their shoes as well, listen to, to their concerns. And it can be done, you know, if I look at the trajectory of history, from the three no's of Khartoum back in 1968, when the whole Arab world said we'll never talk to Israel, we'll never recognize Israel, we'll never have peace with Israel. Now the, the Arab League has repeated again that uh, all of the Arab states will end their conflict with Israel if it solves the Palestinian problem. And it's not as if we don't know what the deal needs to look like. It's not as if, you know, on both sides there aren't majorities in favor of this deal. The problem is how do we get from here to there? Yeah. And that's going to take a, you know, a lot of hard work and, and, and belief again in our partners on the other and side. And when that happens, what happens then? Well, uh, well. <laughs> then we'll all start fighting each other. <laughs>